In this video, I want to answer how I approach the seven biggest struggles that you guys have when you do landscape photography. So I asked on Instagram a few weeks ago and some of the answers were more or less the same. So I put them together in this video and I want to answer them how I would approach them. So the first thing that you all agreed about, which is like everybody's problem, is that time is of course a thing that we all struggle with. Now, I do not know how your lives are, so it's something you need to figure out yourself. However, the second thing that you all agreed about, which will be the first thing I would actually want to answer in this video, is that you struggle so much with finding good photos in your local landscapes. No matter if you are from Denmark, as I am, from the Netherlands, southern England, or wherever else you're from. And how I approach it generally as a landscape photographer in Denmark, and Denmark not being one of the biggest landscape photography locations in the world, is that I go out and I explore. That is like the number one thing to do. And I know it's an answer that not all of you actually like to hear, because it takes time, it takes a lot of legwork, but it is... It is what you have to do. Sometimes when I drive from A to B, I take another road. And in that way, I explore my local landscapes. I also go out and try to find new trails. So I walk on these trails both out and back again because the landscape can look quite different dependent on what direction you're walking. If you are allowed to leave the trails and explore a forest or an area and see it from different perspectives, that is what I would highly recommend that you do. Just laying on your couch watching Netflix does not help. You can do a little bit of research from home and look up what your local tourist information, tourist guides have to offer. That is also an approach that I have or use Google Earth to check out where people pin photos and see what other people photograph in the field. Another thing you can do to take interesting photographs locally is simply just to go out when the weather is interesting. So atmosphere, fog, storm clouds, and the classic, the golden hour, photograph when the light is good, when the atmosphere is interesting, when the weather is interesting. Usually, I would argue you don't really need interesting subjects to photograph. Here is some photos that I've taken over the past year where the subjects are actually rather boring in and of themselves. If I photograph these places without interesting weather, without interesting atmosphere, without interesting light, it would just be, there, there wouldn't even be a photo. So go out on days where there's actually interesting weather conditions. And the last thing you can do is to look up what foreigners who visit your country is actually photographing. Obviously many will go to the big iconic locations in your country and in your local area, but for the most part those people also find other things that they find to be interesting, that is unique probably, to your country. So chances are the main reason why you cannot find anything interesting to photograph in your country is that for you, your landscapes are mundane, but for other people, they may be special. So by looking at what foreigners actually photograph in your country, there's a decent chance that you can learn what it is that is actually interesting and not particularly mundane in the macro perspective of the world. So definitely check out what foreigners are photographing in your country. So the second thing that you all apparently agreed about you struggle with is composition. And I've talked about it so much on my channel here. So obviously go and watch all my videos on composition. To put it shortly, first and foremost, I for the most part always try to find some kind of subject. I may not know what subject it is to begin with when I go out and photograph, but usually Throughout all my photos, there's a very clear subject, something that your eye can anchor itself to, and from there you can explore the photo. Then, obviously, you want to draw attention to that photo. And the main things is leading lines, framing, and 
make your subject stand out. So if it's a dark subject, make sure it's on a bright background. And if it's a bright subject, make sure it's on a dark background. It is all about pulling attention to your subject and then designing your photo in an aesthetically pleasing or optimal way. This is also the main reason why I usually talk about compositional tools rather than compositional rules. Because tools you can apply, whereas rules are something that you kind of have to follow. So you use the compositional tools and techniques from your toolbox and then you design your photo. Another thing to also often keep in mind when you are composing your photos is that photography is a subtractive art form, whereas painting is an additive art form. So in painting we have a blank canvas and then we add stuff to it. Whereas in photography we already have our scene full of all sorts of different stuff. And then we place ourselves from a perspective where we try to subtract all the things that doesn't add to the photo. And that's basically another way to just try to keep it simple. So not necessarily minimalism, but just include the stuff in your scene that you think is beneficial to the scene and exclude everything that does not add to the scene and it's just a distraction. And of course, if you want to learn even more about composition in landscape photography, be sure to get my two eBooks. Here I go through all the different compositional tools that I use as a landscape photographer when I'm in the field. And again, a million thank you to all of you guys out there who've already got the eBooks. It's because of you that I can run this channel and give you weekly free videos. And there are, of course, links to the ebooks down in the description of this video. So the third thing that you guys really, really struggle a lot with, it seems, is that you get stressed while you're in the field and something in front of you happens and you want to capture it and you don't really know or forget how to use the tools in front of you. So obviously, as I've said in a couple of videos, you need to learn the theory about photography. First, you can learn some of it from me, from photography books, other photography teachers and so forth. And then you go out and get the hands-on experience, go out and practice. But practice deliberately and get that, yeah, hands-on experience. Secondly, it's also important to have the gear that actually fits your needs. Now I have this guy sometimes commenting on my videos that each time I recommend a zoom lens, he seems to get angry and be like, no, 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 you have to use primes. And yes, I agree. Primes generally have a tendency to have better image quality. But for the most part, modern zoom lenses has actually become really, really good. And personally, I would rather bring two lenses out into the field than a collection of 10 lenses where I would have to change the lens each time I see something new I want to photograph in the field. I would much rather compromise a little bit on the image quality than actually missing out on getting the photo because I was fiddling around with what lens I should put on the camera. Like, duh. <laughs> and the last thing that I would highly, highly recommend that you learn is to juggle with the camera settings, with the exposure triangle. You need to learn about shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. So in a thought experiment here, you're standing in a scene and you need a faster shutter speed because some birds are flying in. So can you, in this specific example, open up the aperture and compromise a little bit on the depth of field to get that faster shutter speed, or will you have to up the ISO and then compromise and get a little bit more noise in the photo? And how much can you actually up that ISO before you get too much noise in the photo for your own taste? And these are the things that you need to learn, that there is no perfect settings, but there are optimal settings relative to the scene you're photographing. So learn to juggle and find those settings relatively fast, 
so that when things happen in the field, then you can get the photo and you're not stressed about it. So the next thing, which is also a little bit of a funny thing that I think all human beings struggle with, is to get out of bed early in the morning. And I also struggle with that. Considering summertime, and if you're living in the latitudes like Denmark or Sweden, Norway, Scotland, something like that, then consider actually doing an all-nighter during summertime. I showed that in a video from a couple of weeks ago where I took an all-nighter and it's probably easier just to stay awake all through the night because usually through night, if there's something worth photographing at sunrise like morning mist or something like that, there's a good chance that there will also be fog and mist during night. And if there's none of that, then you probably have clear sky or something like that. So you can either photograph stars and if you're up here where we are at these latitudes, then chances are it will be too bright for the stars, but you will probably have noctilucent clouds instead. So there's something to photograph all through the night, also before sunrise happens. Now, if uh, an all-nighter is not on the table, getting up at four in the morning can be really, really hard. I know firsthand, I do it a lot. But what I do is that when the alarm rings, I just stop the alarm and roll out of bed and then I'm up. I do not start to contemplating my life decisions about whether or not to get out of bed. That is the worst thing you can do when you wake up. Yes, you're tired, but just get out of bed. I found that that is the easiest way to do it. Don't think about it, just do it. And it's of course also easier to get out of bed if there's actually an intention behind the insanity that there's actually a good chance of you going out and photographing something of interest. So for the most part, obviously, I don't get out of bed at four in the morning if there's no chance of sunrise or morning fog or something like that. I just sleep. So I check the weather forecast the night before. Is there a chance? Yes or no? If there is a chance and a good chance, then I get out of bed. Sometimes I don't get anything. It does happen. But for the most part, over time, you learn how the weather forecasts behave and you know whether or not there is a good chance to actually get a photograph. So a fifth thing that it seems that many of you struggle with is that you compare your own work to someone else's. And some of you even suffer from imposter syndrome, which means basically that you are an imposter in a community where you like feel that you, you don't belong, you're not good enough to be there. So first and foremost, we are obviously all our own worst critics. We all know how our photos could have been better when we come home and we work through the photos. And we were like, ah, oh, if I had just done this in the field, then it would have been so much better. I do it myself all the time. The best way to get around that, at the very least for me, is just to try a lot of different things in the field. Because it is hard to see how the final photo will be, even though you have your screen on your camera that you use to compose the photo. Sometimes when you have worked a lot on one photo and you have found the composition that you want, when you come back home, it's just not at all as you wanted it to be. So try a lot of different things in the field. That's the first thing to do. But in regard to comparing yourself to other people, remember, do not, when it comes to yourself, do not judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree. The person you are and the person you are comparing yourself with are probably two completely different human beings and your stories and what you have learned is probably completely different. It's important to remember, like how long have the person that you compare your photos to been taking photos? If that person has been taking photos every day for the past 30 years, chances are there's a good reason why that person is really, really good at photography. And if you've only been photographing for two years yourself, once or twice a week, then there's a good chance that the reason why you're not as good as him is because you simply just not have the same amount of time or experience that that one photographer. Also, on the other hand, if you put yourself up to it and you photograph a lot like each day for a couple of years, then you will very fast overtake a person who have only been photographing for like a couple of hours a week for 30 years. 
It's more a question about, in my experience, the total amount of time that you've actually been photographing, rather than for how long you've been photographing. And I would even argue that it is okay to compare your own photos to someone else's photos. Just don't let it get to you. Just don't let it get you down. Because by comparing your own photos to someone else's, you can kind of maybe get an idea about where you are in your journey and where you want to go with your photography. And by comparing to someone else, you may also figure out that you do not want to make this kind of photography. You rather want to make this kind of photography when you compare to someone else again. So, yeah, don't hammer yourself too hard in regard to... uh, to feel like you're an imposter or that you're not good enough as landscape photographer. It all comes down to practice, 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 deliberate practice. So an awfully specific thing that some of you guys seem to struggle with is that you are having a hard time finding good foregrounds for your wide angle compositions. Now, personally, when it comes to these things, sometimes there's just not a shot for a wide angle. Sometimes there's just not a foreground, and that is okay. If there is no foreground, consider shooting with another lens. Sometimes a wide angle is not the answer to your landscape photos. Sometimes a wide angle actually goes against what it is you want to photograph. So try to zoom a little bit more in and forget about that immediate extreme foreground that kind of like even falls out of the photo. In this example here from the Faroe Islands, I do have a foreground, which is myself standing on the cliffs here in the foreground. Then I have a midground, which is the rocks in the ocean. And then I have the background island and clouds. Now, I do not have that extreme foreground that kind of pops into the face. But I have a little bit of foreground grass, but that grass is not particularly interesting. Now, it adds a little bit of depth to the photo having it there. But that's the only reason why it's there, because it's not really particularly interesting. What's interesting is me standing on the rocks looking out into this beautiful, moody scene. So instead of trying to force a wide-angle perspective, consider if it's not worth zooming a little bit more in or composing it a little bit different. And if you struggle with editing your photos, be sure to enroll in my big Photoshop for Landscape Photographers post-processing course. I've designed it so it's very progressive, and easy to learn. So we start out in the simple department where we learn all the programs in a very focused way. I go through the different things that you need to know about in Photoshop. Then there's a big section about all the different tools that I use as a landscape photographer, the editing techniques. And then there's a section where I make some start to finish tutorials where I use some of the techniques and I also cover some minor techniques that I didn't show in the tools section. And then there's a big section where I have a lot of start to finish tutorials with different kinds of photos, with different kinds of objectives. And what you will learn is everything from focus stacking, blending photos, editing with luminosity masks, cleaning your photos in a seamless way, and everything where you respect the light, and much, much, much more. There is a coupon code down in the description of this video. So be sure to use that if you want to save a little bit of money. So a seventh thing that many of you seem to struggle with is that it's very hard to reflect the majesty of nature. And I know especially what you're talking about. When we are talking about landscape photography, we usually consider the wide angle lens to be a landscape photography lens, the landscape photography lens. But the problem with wide angle lenses is that you are either including a lot of the sky and the sky is huge and that will make the landscape seem very small. It can work great for minimalist photos, but usually minimalist photos does not reflect the majesty of nature. And if you are tilting your wide angle down and including that extreme foreground that I just talked about, then for the most part, the background will just be very, very small. So for the most part, when I try to reflect the majesty of nature, I try to avoid the wide angle lens, unless of course the landscape invites to it, the specific scene invites to it, but it's often in very dramatic scenes. But for the most part, I, again, I zoom in. So in these two photos here from Sacheta, 
in the Dolomites in Italy. You can see one photo taken at around 40 millimeter and one taken with a wide angle lens at around 16 millimeter. And for me, there's no doubt about that it is the 40 millimeter shot, the zoomed in shot that really reflects how big these mountains are. Even though the composition of the wide angle photo is pretty good, it does not reflect the majesty of nature. In this photo here from the Faroe Islands, I wanted it to be a wide angle photo because I wanted to put emphasis on this beautiful greenish rock in the foreground. It kind of looks a little bit like the earth in miniature format. And looking at the background, which is also really beautiful, it, it's a beautiful scene, there I'm not really reflecting the majesty of nature here, even though it's a big epic scene in the background, and it's simply because the foreground takes up so much of the photo. And in these photos here, I'm shooting with the long lens instead, where I'm a little bit further away from the scene I want to photograph, and then I zoom in, so I make this perspective compression. And in that way, it is much easier to reflect how big nature really is, and to show scale. And especially when you put human objects into the scene that we viewers, we humans, can relate to, then it's much easier to see how big these mountains are, or these sea stacks, or trees, or whatever it is you want to photograph. And this is, of course, also one of the things I talk about in my ebooks. It is how to show scale in your photos. So when it comes to the majesty of nature, what I do is usually I try to avoid the wide angle lens, and no matter what focal length I shoot at, I try to somehow put some kind of scale into the photo that we humans can relate to, usually a human being. So what is your biggest struggle as a landscape photographer? How do you try to solve it? And maybe some of you guys can help each other out and answer each other's biggest struggles. As always, I would highly appreciate both a like and a comment. Check out the links down in the description if you want to learn even more with my ebooks and my Photoshop course. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching.